meeting of the Civil Law and Data Practices Policy Committee to order. Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, today is Thursday, February 10th, 2022. Want to welcome all our members, all our staffers, our pages, uh, those that help work behind the scenes to get this set up. Uh, thanks for being here as we start out a new year in this committee and uh, appreciate, uh, appreciate every one of your efforts. Uh, we are going to move a few bills uh, off the agenda today and we'll start with Senator Johnson with Senate file 2638. Senator Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Senate file 2638 deals with the lovely and fast paced world of uh, real estate and real estate title. Uh, so with me today, I have uh, uh, somebody who is not new to civil law and, and property matters here has uh, testified several times, but would like to go through the bill and, and talk a little bit about what the technical changes within the bill are uh, and, and what we're working on today. Uh, Mr. Dunlevy, welcome to the committee. If you'd state your name for the record and then feel free to begin. Hi, my name is Kevin Dunlevy and I'm the co-chair of the legislative committee of the real property section of the State Bar Association. Now somebody has to cue the trumpet fanfare. But, uh, uh, so this bill is, um, as Senator Johnson says, it is the exciting world of real estate title law and uh, takes somebody like me to get excited by it. The purpose of this is to make the torrent system um, more user friendly and for the public and also more economical for the judicial system so that it takes less court time to do uh, some of the things that need to be done. And I don't know how much detail you want me to get into on that. Senator Johnson. Mr. Mr. Chair. I think there's, there's probably just a couple of high points if you'd like to kind of hit on, on two or three of the major changes. A lot of that was conforming changes to the, the substantive change, but if you want to just hit on how maybe this, uh, this does help with the, with the registration of that title, that would be helpful. Okay, Mr. Yeah. Chair, Mr. Uh, Dunlevy. Mr. Senator Johnson, I will help proceed. I'm forgetting my etiquette, I apologize, because I haven't done this for a couple of years. Um, okay, so sub subdivision two, section one, uh, makes it so that if two adjoining properties have basically the same title problem, they can be combined into one action. So that, that takes less court time and saves money for the property owners. Um, section two, this is uh, when, somebody, when somebody wants to torrent property or make it uh, registered property under chapter 508, they have to do an application and go through a judicial process to get the court to decide that it's um, registered property, then a certificate of title is issued. And uh, this says that the initial registration should be run by the examiner of titles. And the, the purpose of that is to just make it so that there's nothing, um, nothing that's unusual in the petition that could be handled more easily by talking to the examiner. And in, in my practice, I've been doing this for 30 years it always makes a lot of sense to go talk to the examiner of titles before you bring a petition or an application. So this codifies that. Uh, okay, section three. There's, there are several sections here and all that they do is add, you can provide other evidence other than an abstract of title in order to register title. Now, it's hard to get abstracts anymore. I haven't seen an abstract in, a, in one of my transactions probably for 20 years. Um, and so it's very difficult and this allows the use of other evidence. Most counties have what's called a tract index and a lot of them are online. And so you go and you look at the tract index um, and an abstract is basically just a summary of the tract index. So another one is uh, at the bottom of page four that allows people to basically consent to a registration so you don't have to go through service of process and the expense of a process server. Uh, six and seven, that's just the other evidence making it so you don't need to use an abstract. And then uh, section, section 10 of the bill says that 
Okay, so section 508, chapter 508 is a, is a cheaper uh, method of registering title, but it takes longer, it takes like five years as compared to maybe a year or six months. Uh, and so in the end, the examiner of titles gives a directive and that, that results in the first certificate of title. And this says that certificate uh, is issued when the examiner uh, issues the directive and the directive is recorded and provided to the registrar of titles. So that's in a nutshell what the bill does. Thank you, Mr. Dunlavy. Um, any other comments, Senator Johnson? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. No, I I just like to um, you know, urge the committee support of the bill. I think it's a just it's a very technical bill, but uh, something that will absolutely make uh, transactional costs a little bit less in the state in registering it with the torrent system. So, thank you. Any questions from committee members in person or or on? Uh, on Zoom, uh, Senator Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just a question for uh, Mr. Dunlevy or for the author. Uh, what what precipitated bringing this legislation forward? Um, Mr. Dunlevy. Mr. Chair and Senator Anderson, this is essentially what's happened over the years is it's, it's becoming impossible to get abstracts in a lot of counties. People aren't becoming abstractors. And so it's, in a, in a sense, this is codifying the way things are happening now in the system. And, it, and some of the other things are improvements to make it less expensive. Senator so, Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So Mr. Dunleavy, do you see any uh, downfalls uh, by passing this legislation later on if there is no abstract uh, required in these uh, dealings? Mr. Dunleavy. Mr. Chair, Senator Anderson, I, I don't. I mean, I, like I've mentioned, I, I haven't seen an abstract for a long time. And, and um, I go online when I wanna check the title to something, I, I go look at the internet and I get it from the county's website. Okay, Senator Thank Anderson. Thank you. All right, uh, any other questions from committee members? And double checking anyone online. Um, seeing none, uh, Senator Johnson, uh, I believe you'll move your bill to general orders. Is that correct? So moved. Uh, Senator Johnson moves that Senate file 2638 be recommended to pass and be referred to general orders. All those in favor, uh, oh, and those online, please uh, unmute. All those. All those in favor of that motion, please say aye. 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 Opposed say no. The motion prevails. Thank you, Senator Johnson. Um, all right, now members, we have the, the remaining bills on the agenda are rule 47 bills. Uh, we heard these bills last year, passed them out of committee um, and they uh, did not have action on the floor. Um, I am going to ask our counsel, uh, uh, Ms. Primo, uh, to give just an explanation of the Rule 47 process and uh, what members should expect uh, with these bills here on our schedule uh, remaining. Ms. Primo. Mr. Chair and members, Rule 47 can be found in the Senate rules, which are available online on our Senate website. And it provides that um, at the end of the odd year of session, when um, we adjourn to a date later in, in the second year, um, at that point, all bills that are on general orders are referred back, they're returned to the standing committee from which they were last reported. And so the bills you see um, remaining on the agenda today um, were sent back to civil law because we were the last committee to take action and send it to general orders last session. Thank you, uh, Ms. Primo. Um, so members, we did do uh, substantive debates on these bills. Um, it's not my intention to have testifiers and everyone discussing uh, them all uh, before. Um, can uh, Senator Latz, I see your hand up. Senator Latz. 
Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, <clears throat> Rule 47 uh, simply re returns the bill to your committee, um, but it does not say anything about <clears throat> uh, how the committee handles the bill in the future. Um, and uh, so my understanding is that the motions today would be uh, to recommend that bills be passed and, and uh, sent to the Senate floor, I presume, um, which means that we are making uh, independent uh, judgments again and affirming or, or not affirming our support for a bill on the merits, even though, uh, yeah, well, it, as we vote on each bill today. So uh, this is what will happen in committee today will be more than merely a technical uh, sending the bill back to the floor. What was technical um, was the bill being sent from the floor back to the committee. Uh, so I think it is valid, at least for us to uh, have some discussion, have to have a summary of each bill before it's voted on and, and to open the, uh, the uh, committee up for conversation among the members anyway, if, if you're not intending to have any testimony on the merits or demerits of each bill. Yep, Senator Latz, uh, thank you for that. Um, that's I do have all of the, uh, the authors or those that are uh, presenting the bills uh, there on hand for that purpose. Um, uh, you, you're definitely correct. You have a right for asking questions or whatnot. Um, I am reminded members though that these were uh, debates that we did have in last year's session as we vetted them there. Uh, and Ms. Primo, I had one more item I was gonna ask you to uh, touch on, just uh, describe um, the amendments uh, that we're having to these bills and uh, help the committee understand what we'll expect. And we'll go through them as well, uh, bill by bill, but um, give us the, the overview of the, the manner of the amendments we'll be seeing. Mr. Chair and members, I believe there is only one amendment and it will be to SF 1253. And that amendment updates the um, effective date of the bill from 2021 to 2022, I believe. Um, and that was simply a, a technical change. The other bills did not need um, any updates to their effective dates. Okay, thank you, Ms. Primo. Um, so we will go to Senate file 208, the Senator Ingebrigtsen bill, which I believe is gonna be presented again by Senator Limmer. If uh, Senator Limmer is on the Zoom screen. I am, Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator Limmer. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, as you mentioned, Senator Ingebrigtsen, is uh, is not capable of being with us today, so I will present his bill, Senate file number 208. And it regards law enforcement hiring information access or accessibility. Uh, the bill expands the requirement that employers comply with law enforcement's law enforcement agencies' request for employment records of an employee or a former employee who's applying to become a police officer. This is expanded to also apply to uh, employment other than a peace officer by a law enforcement agency. The bill provides that if access is denied by an applicant, uh, an authorized representative of the law enforcement agency may request a court order directing the disclosure of that information. It's fairly straightforward, Mr. Chair, but I will stand for any discussion. And we did vote on this uh, last year, I believe, by the same committee. Any discussion to this bill, uh, Senator Latz? Sorry, I forgot to lower my hand last time. No discussion okay. on this. Any discussion? Seeing none. Um, if uh, Senator Limmer, then if you'll move uh, the bill for a re referral to general orders. Uh, Mr. Chair, I move Senate file number 208. Be recommended pass and move to the Senate uh, general orders. All those in favor of that motion say aye. 
Aye. Aye. Opposed say no. A motion prevails. Thank you, members. Thank you, Senator Limmer. Um, next up is Senate file 28, uh, Senator Howe. If you'd come give a, a brief overview of the bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Senate Files 028, uh, what it does is current law actually requires a landlord to uh, bring an attorney in these eviction cases. And uh, what it does is it limits the attorney fees to the landlord to $5. What the bill does is changes that to reasonable attorney fees and subsequently removes the requirement to have an attorney present. So hopefully there are no reasonable attorney fees so they can represent themselves. That's what the bill does. Thank you, Senator Howe. Any discussion from members? Senator Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm concerned as a practicing attorney that you're taking away my livelihood here with this bill. I'm just kidding. No, it, <laughs> sounds, it sounds like a great bill. I appreciate it. Any further discussion? All Mr. right. Chairman. See, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Senator Latz, my apologies. Um, no, no problem. Um, <clears throat> could I uh, get a little more clarity? on what the issue is that this is a seeking, what the problem is that this is seeking to uh, fix? Senator Howe. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and uh, Senator Latz, what, what this is trying to, to alleviate is when there was a requirement for these landlords to have an attorney when they presented their unlawful retainer and even though they were required to have an attorney there at that proceeding, the maximum reimbursement they could get from the courts uh, from, the, from the folks was $5. So it really put an undue burden on the, on the landlord. Furthermore, it didn't seem reasonable why these landlords were required to have an attorney in the first place. So this, what this does is if they do have an attorney, it allows them to recover reasonable attorney fees. And what it does is then in uh, section two removes the requirement to have an attorney. So hopefully we don't have those reasonable attorney fees required any anyway. So that's what the bill does. So if it if it just removes the five dollar limit because I don't know how many attorneys work for five dollars anymore, and uh, the other thing it does is it removes the requirement to have one anyway. Senator Lass, Mr. Chairman, uh, thank you. Um, <clears throat> so would these apply to? Uh, in all courts, uh, conciliation court and uh, district court. Senator Howe. It, it, it pertains uh, specifically to those requirements in 504B.291 subdivision one. And so any action under that proceeding, this would apply to. Senator Latz. Well, I'm, I'm not overly familiar with 504B, uh, so perhaps counsel can answer the question for me. Um, will this apply to conciliation court as well as district court cases or are all of these actions in district court? Uh, Ms. Primo. Mr. Chair and members, um, so I think the question is about the attorney representation language in section two. It would apply to any action that um, 
where a landlord is required to make an appearance or proceed that falls under Chapter 504B. So in general, if you think about Ramsey County and Hennepin County, that's generally going to be an in-housing um, court. But I'm not sure how that um, is structured in some of the other district courts. So it, it could, where I don't think they have specific housing courts um, and instead it's um, assigned to maybe a specific judge. So that would just be, yes, district court cases. Um, and that, that's my understanding of how that language would work. Senator Latz. Uh, so Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, Ms. Primo, uh, the, the general rule in court is that a corporation cannot represent itself um, in court, that they're required to have an attorney represent them in, in litigation. Um, we, I'm not sure if every landlord is a corporation, uh, but how would this uh, fit into that rule? Um, Mr. Mr. Chair and Senator Latz, I believe there are current exceptions for Ramsey and Hennepin County. Um, I can double check on that following this hearing where um, an agent may appear on behalf of a landlord. Um, so that, that's just an exception to that general rule, but only for Ramsey and Hennepin housing court proceedings. Um, and so this statute would function as an exception as well to that general rule, um, where if a landlord is a business entity um, or an organization, their agent um, may appear before in, on behalf of them in Chapter 504B proceedings. Senator Lance. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So this would um, uh, essentially uh, create this exception for all of the other 85 counties in Minnesota that are not covered by the Hennepin and Ramsey County courts. Is, is, that, is that fair to say? Ms. Primo. Mr. Chair and Senator Latz, I, I believe that is the intent of the language. Senator Latz. Um, and Mr. Chairman, um, uh, what if um, a person is being evicted or the landlord is bringing an unlawful detainer action against a person seeking eviction? The person has legitimate defenses. Um, and uh, you know, perhaps related to the maintenance or condition of the property, um, or you know, whatever the, uh, the the other defenses might be, and and uh, they decide to uh, to oppose the eviction uh, proceedings, um, <clears throat> and uh, so they go in in good faith to raise these issues, uh, and it turns out the court doesn't agree with them. Um, but maybe it takes a three hour hearing and a lawyer charging uh, $150 an hour or $250 an hour, uh, or, uh, you know, could be more, could be less, I suppose. Um, <clears throat> but those are, it's, other than public defenders, you don't find too many lawyers uh, compensated at, at rates much lower than what I've just given. Um, and then if the person loses, uh, are they potentially on the hook for an additional $300, $500, $750? Um, would that end up being potentially reduced to a judgment? Could it end up being taken out of tax refunds or could they have their bank accounts garnished to recover that? Um, is it a judgment that is going to be valid against them for 10 years? Is it a judgment that is going to uh, make it that much harder for them to find another place to live. Uh, what if they're being evicted for non-payment of rent um, and uh, um, the reason that they aren't able to pay their rent is because they lost their job. Um, and, you know, they may lose the eviction proceeding, but, uh, you know, does this also mean that they could be taxed an additional $300, dollars $750? Um, you know, which, you know, on top of their, whatever they're struggling with from a job loss, or maybe they got medical bills and they had a tough time 
you know, for a couple of months and, and making full payment on rent, but they've made partial payment, but the landlord still decides they want to bring an eviction action and might be able to prevail under the law, but um, it just, it's like putting a person who's already down on their luck under their heel and squeezing it further. I just don't understand why an exception would be made to the standard rule that parties to a legal matter bear their own costs. Um, especially when you typically have such an uneven balance of, of uh, power and resources as you do in most landlord tenant eviction actions, certainly residential eviction actions. Perhaps, uh, 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 perhaps Senator Howe can help me understand how this might play out under those kind of scenarios. I'll go to Senator Howe and Ms. Primo has her hand up as well. I'll do Senator Howe first. Thank you, Mr. Chair and, and uh, Senator Latz. I think that where this issue arose is that you have an exception for Minneapolis St. Paul that a landlord doesn't actually have to have an attorney to come there. But outside the state of outside those two counties, if you own a property, let's say in Hastings, and I want to bring a lawful, unlawful retainer, I have to have an attorney. So if I have to have an attorney, now you've placed an undue burden on the landlord that he can't, re he, they can't represent themselves in the housing court. So now I have that extra expense. So what this law does is allows me, if you're gonna take me to court, on this, and I'm a landlord, why does Ramsey and Hennepin get an, a benefit that they don't have to have an attorney and they don't have to bear those expenses, but someone in outstate Minnesota does bear those expenses. And what we're trying to do is not only should I fit believe that they should be able to re recover their attorney fees, but hopefully in section two, now we don't force them to have an attorney. We possibly don't have those attorney fees anyway, because now we don't require them to have. It. So that, to me, you place an undue burden on outstate Minnesota landlords when you force them to have an attorney, and when you force them to have one, then you, then you can't. You allow them to recover five dollars. Uh, it's not reasonable, and I do believe that. Not only should they be capable of recovering their reasonable attorney fees, that we don't force them to have an attorney in the first place. So both of those items, and that's the reason the bill came up. Uh, there was a landlord had to bring a had to bring an attorney, and uh, I remember the landlord looking at the attorney and saying, "Well, you heard the judge." All you're worth is $5, but I'll guarantee you, I know that the landlord paid more than $5 for that attorney to be there, but he was forced to bring an attorney at that action. That's what the, why the bill is here. That's the reason we brought it forward. And Ms. Primo, I believe you have a clarification as well. Mr. Chair and members, yes, I just want to, I wanted to clarify in case my comments um, were confusing, but the bill is, the bill has two sections and although both section, sections have to do with attorney fees and representation, they are somewhat um, separate and distinct issues. So the first bill that makes, the first section that makes changes to reasonable attorney's fees makes that change specific to when a tenant would like to redeem the tenancy in response to an eviction action for non-payment. So then they would have, under current law, they um, have to make the payment or whatever is outstanding and bring the $5 reasonable attorney fee either to the landlord or to the court. But here that $5 would Five, those five, that five dollars would change to reasonable attorney's fees. So it really affects the ability to redeem the tenancy. And that's a separate um, issue than the representation issue, which um, was amended on in this committee last session um, by, when it was offered as, as an amendment. So, Mr. Chairman.
Mr. Chairman, you're muted. Senator Lance, can you? I just heard that, but everyone on the screen appears to be muted to me. We're having a technical issue. Go ahead, Senator Lance. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So we're really dealing with two distinct questions here. One is the question of whether or not a landlord ought to be able to represent him or herself or send an, a non-attorney agent to court for an eviction action. And I don't have a big problem with that portion of it. Uh, actually, I, I don't have any problem with that portion of it. Um, <clears throat> I am concerned about the other portion, uh, which as I'm reading the bill uh, is consistent with what Ms. Primo has described, that it's, it's only an applicable question during an attempted uh, redemption of the tenancy for, for so it, it would not apply. It looks like from the statute um, that's reproduced in the bill, it looks like it would not apply to uh, eviction notices that are for purposes other than failure to pay rent. Um, so it's only uh, rent delinquency type evictions. Um, and it also does not appear to be a prevailing party provision, uh, but rather a provision that deals with just with the attempted redemption. Um, so I guess, it, I guess let me ask Ms. Primo that question first for clarification. I'll have a follow up. But this is not a this is not changing the prevailing party turning this into a prevailing party provision is it it's just a redemption process and senator Latz, let me check again make sure you can hear me through the desk mic here now i can thank you okay perfect uh ms primo mr chair and senator Latz, that is correct senator Latz. thank you so mr chairman with with that understanding <clears throat> um i, I can I have a problem with the first part of the bill. Um, so basically at that point, a landlord actually could, if they wanted to, they could hire a lawyer. They could go into court on an eviction. They could by their own initiative, um, especially if they think they are, if they're highly confident they're going to prevail, they could in effect impose attorney's fees costs on a, on a departing tenant um, that were try, what was trying to redeem their, their uh, tenancy by advancing the rent. Plus, a tenant would have no idea how much money to bring in to court to attempt that redemption. I mean, the statute provides that the tenant may at any time before possession has been delivered redeem the tenancy and be restored to possession by paying to the landlord or bringing to court the amount of the rent that is in arrears with interest costs and attorney's fees not to exceed $5. But if they come to court and they have no idea what the reasonable attorney's fees would be if this provision is changed, uh, they're gonna have that much harder time. Um, and a landlord could frankly raise the barrier to redemption by hiring a lawyer to go in and do it. And they might decide that's worth it um, because while a person may be able to come up with the next five hundred dollars in back rent, they might not be able to come up with a thousand dollars to pay back rent in, uh, you know, two or three hours of an attorney's time um, for that uh, to redeem their tenancy. Uh, so I'm I'm really concerned about that. Um, yeah, I, I'm. I'm troubled by that prospect. Now, I don't think it's fair for a court to turn to a lawyer and say, apparently you're only worth $5 an hour. I mean, I, I'd be shocked actually if a judge said that in good faith. Um, 
And uh, um, I mean, I'm in court four or five days a week. I, I, I've never heard a judge actually say something to that effect, you know, and really meaning it. Um, uh, and that's not to say, you know, $5 is, is the right number. That's part of the problem with putting dollar amounts or frankly, interest rates in statute because they can get outdated pretty fast. Um, um, and it looks like, I don't know how far back the statute goes, uh, but, you know, and I don't know if it's even fair to put a dollar amount in there. Maybe $5 is not the right amount, but reasonable attorney's fees is certainly going to be more than, you know, $25 or whatever you want to put in there. So I think it, it would really unlevel the playing field even further and create an incentive for a, uh, uh, for a um, landlord to even raise the barriers to force out a tenant that is delinquent on their rent for whatever reason they might be delinquent. Um, so I think maybe what I'll do is I'll, I'll move the, uh, I'll move that we divide the bill, um, divide the question and, and divide it between section one and two. And I would support section two but I would oppose section one. Uh, thank you, Senator Latz. Um, getting uh, some counsel here. Would you rather just uh, make a motion to delete section one and have the committee uh, debate that motion? Well, I could do it either way, Mr. Chairman. Um, it would have the, presumably the same uh, effect because either way we vote on the <laughs> section separately. So if it's easier to do it that way, I'll move to delete section one of the bill. All right. Thank you. Senator Latz moves an oral amendment for deleting section one of the bill. Uh, Senator Howe. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I would like staff uh, to, Ms. Primo, to explain to me who sets reasonable attorney fees in that proceeding? Uh, Ms. Primo. Mr. Chair and Senator Howe, generally reasonable attorney fees are, are determined by a court. Um, you know, a, 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 an attorney would file um, documents showing what would be appropriate and that would be that would result in a hearing. I, I actually am not entirely sure how it works in, in redeeming the tenancy because the statute specifically says you may pay to the landlord or bring to the court. But I assume in practice, these are all being taken to the court. So there ends up being, being a hearing, but I would really have to confirm with, with people who practice in this area. Um, um, that's a knowledge base that I don't have. I can clarify that after the hearing. Senator Howe. Thank you. But would, would it be fair to say that the judge would determine reasonable attorney fees? Ms. Primo. In a proceeding? Yeah, yes, Sen Mr. Chair and Senator Howe. Generally, yes. Uh, in, in proceedings before the court, reasonable attorney fees are determined by, by the court, by the, a judge. And Senator Howe, if you'd also want to speak to the, the oral amendment of deleting the section as well, um, Senator Howe. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I came here with the idea that the judge would set reasonable attorney fees and the, the judge determines that uh, it's not reasonable to charge an exorbitant amount of money for an attorney. I think that they would have all due latitude. And I never intended to imply that a judge said that the attorney was only worth $5. The deal was that the, what had to actually happen in that hearing was the judge remitted the $5 for attorney fees in the proceeding. The landlord turned to the attorney and said, well, the judge says you're, and the law says you're only worth $5. Of course, the landlord paid more than that. That's where that $5 comment came from. But I would say that I believe that this is an important part of the bill. Uh, in order for 
attorneys, uh, in order for landlords to be fairly represented, if they have to bring an attorney, uh, I would think that they wouldn't bring an attorney if they did not have to. So the, section two is important, but if they end up bringing an attorney, uh, I believe that the judge should determine what that attorney is worth. Otherwise, how else are, do you, is the landlord to recover any attorney fees? Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator House. Senator Latz. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I think it's true a judge would make that determination. Um, and a judge would look at the attorney's uh, experience in that particular field and years of practice um, at the amount of time that they spent dealing with the case. And that would be in uh, filing the, uh, the unlawful detainer action, as well as travel time to the court, appearing in court, waiting around for the case to be called. Um, travel time back uh, after court is done. That's all the amount of time that will be involved. Um, their usual hourly rate. Um, and as I say, most, most lawyers are, you know, would be charging well over $100 an hour uh, for uh, most of their cases. Um, they, they, they look at, you know, the, the particular difficulty of that case. Um, so there, there's Reasonable attorney's fees is, is the kind of thing that, you know, you look as a practical matter, be very difficult. And, and actually it's gonna set up, it might set up a completely different proceeding uh, when the lawyer says, uh, I, I've spent this much time, I've got this much experience. This is a particularly difficult case for this reason. Um, and then the tenant says, well, I don't think that makes any sense. And then maybe you end up with another hearing, um, or certainly additional time in determining whether or not, you know, the lawyer's uh, claimed reasonable uh, fee is truly reasonable. I'm not sure the courts would be too happy to have to start making those determinations either. Um, and, uh, and as I say, it, it would really be unfair to the tenants who, you know, found a way to come up with the, the rent that's in arrears and any uh, uh, interest that would apply plus the costs of the action. Um, and then they have uh, you know, a landlord come in with a lawyer that's gonna say his fee is $350 an hour. And the landlord might decide it's worth it to do that just because they know that the tenant's not gonna be able to come up with the attorney's fees on top of everything else and, and, uh, and ultimately kick the tenant out. Uh, so I think, uh, you know, Senator Howe, I think has an opportunity here to turn what may be a uh, controversial bill. Um, I will certainly make it controversial as it proceeds forward um, into what would more likely be um, a consensus bill um, without any controversy. Um, if he's willing to delete section one, um, I think he's also more likely uh, to make some progress um, on the house side. Um, sorry, when the other body, just taking a look here at the status. Uh, this was introduced a, you know, over a year ago in the house and it hasn't moved. Um, so uh, uh, it, it, might, it might well, if he's willing to delete section one, he might well be able to make a lot of progress on this bill, uh, even maybe get it moving in the other body and see something become law. Uh, whereas if he uh, is unwilling to delete section one, uh, this bill may stall out before it gets very far at all, even in the Senate, let alone in the other body. So trying to find some common ground here, trying to find some consensus I uh, don't know if Senator Howe is open uh, to trying to work on a, on a bipartisan basis on something like this, but uh, here's an opportunity uh, to do so. And I think uh, I would support the bill if it moves forward only um, with section two. Any further discussion to the amendment? All right, seeing none members, please unmute. Uh, all those in favor of the oral amendment to delete section one, please say aye. Aye. 
Opposed say no. 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 The amendment does not prevail. Back on Senate file 28 as a whole. Uh, any final comments, Senator Howe? No, I appreciate the, the lively discussion. I think we could have some more discussion before it reaches, when it reaches the floor, but I, I do believe that uh, we debated this uh, fairly well the last time, and then I believe it was Senator Westrom added to the section two, uh, and I think it's, uh, I think it's reasonable. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Howe. Uh, members, if you would unmute again and turn on your microphones uh, for the final vote. Uh, all those in, we need a motion. Uh, Senator Anderson, if you'd move uh, Senate file 28 uh, to general orders. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. I move that Senate file 28 be recommended to pass and passed on to sent to the Senate floor on general orders. Thank you, Senator Anderson. All in favor of that motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed say no. No. Motion prevails. Thank you, Senator Howe. I am now going to pass the gavel to Senator Johnson. Thank you, Senator Matthews. Uh, you are going to be presenting 1025. Uh, Senator Matthews, to your bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senate file 1025 is a bill that had a rigorous debate last year. Uh, its goal is to bring some fairness in construction contracts, uh, help small businesses across the state. Uh, the bill uh, essentially adds the word defend to the definition of indemnification agreement, uh, ensuring each party is responsible for uh, their own actions. Uh, and corresponding attorney fees. Uh, it aligns the Minnesota practice with the American rule. It creates a parity in public and private construction contracts by requiring public projects to follow the same principles of basic fairness uh, we expect from everyone else. Uh, the bill had broad support uh, from 19 different associations last year when we debated this and uh, I uh, would appreciate members' support to the bill. Any further discussion on 1025, members? Seeing none, I'd like to make a motion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I will move uh, Senate file 1025 uh, to be recommended to pass and sent to general orders. All right, members, unmute yourself. All those in favor of the motion, please indicate by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Motion passes. All right, thank you, Senator Johnson. Our final bill will be Senate file 1253, Senator Chamberlain. If you wanna come give a brief overview of your bill again, welcome to the committee. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Uh, Chairman. Senator Limmer. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I was told there might be a technical amendment, uh, A3. I believe that is correct, Senator Limmer. It, it might be um, appropriate to consider it at this time. I believe it's simply technical, but I'll, uh, okay. I would move the A3 amendment, but have council uh, describe it. Thank you, good idea. We'll uh, move this technical amendment first and then allow Senator Chamberlain to speak to it. Uh, Ms. Primo, if you would uh, describe the A3 amendment. Mr. Chair and members, the A3 amendment updates the effective date at line 3.25, um, page three, line 25 um, from July 1st, 2021 to July 1st, uh, 2022. Thank you, Ms. Primo. Any discussion to the amendment? Seeing none, please unmute yourselves. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 
Opposed, no. The amendment is adopted. So now that we have that updated, Senator Chamberlain, thank you for that. Thank you for uh, coming to our committee. I always thank people for the invite, appreciate it. Senate file 1253 was heard in this committee last year. We had a lengthy discussion on it. It is a non-discrim, allows for a civil action for, for discrimination against, uh, in short, in some electronic platforms. Uh, this was passed out of this committee last year, sent to general orders. It was rule 47 back down here. So we're just here to, I guess, maybe say hi and send her back to the floor. Any discussion to the bill? Senator Bigham. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm not, we did have quite the discussion last year, so I don't think we need to, uh, rehash that. Um, one, I would ask for a roll call. Roll call has been granted. Senator Brigham. Um, and just for, for members that um, there have been uh, successful challenges in Texas and Florida to a similar line of legislation. Um, and the courts uh, in both have said it would be um, that, that the, the courts would say that the, the laws are unconstitutional, this bill would be. Um, and that these are social media platforms, not First Amendment um, vehicles. Uh, that's from the government. So um, again, I don't think we need to rehash it, but I, I'm gonna remain opposed to it. Um, and I think the courts will figure this out if this miraculously would pass the House, which I don't think it will. Thank you, Senator Bigham. Any further discussion, Senator Latz? Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first, I'd like to ask that the uh, roll call be recorded in the journal. Is there three hands? You can use the raise hand feature if you're remote as well. So far, I only see two hands. Is Carlson on? Carlson's on, has his hand up. Are you raising it? Okay. I couldn't find your, uh, my Zoom screen setting wasn't set correctly to see you, Senator Carlson, that's my bad. All right, seeing three hands, uh, the vote will be recorded in the roll call. Senator Latz. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I will just reiterate that this, this creates an awful lot of, um, uh, actually, I think it gives a lot uh, uh, more power um, to some social media, um, which I think would, would uh, have the opposite effect of, of perhaps the author's intent, but it, it, it creates enormous amount of ambiguity uh, with regard to um, how violations would be defined. Uh, you know, would the social media platforms have the ability to delete hate speech from their platforms, uh, for example, uh, on whatever end of the political or philosophical spectrum? Uh, at what point does speech cross the line? Uh, from legitimate political discourse into hate speech or perhaps even inciting violence? Um, what if they delete something that they think would incite violence? Um, and by doing so, they open themselves up to potentially millions of dollars of fines um, with damages of $50,000 per violation. I'm not sure if that means is a violation the one-time deletion uh, or is it an ongoing violation? Um, you know, like as every day considered a violation that it's that whatever content is no longer on there. Um, you know, what if, what if they think it's a bot or what, what if it's an anonymous account? What if they believe that it is? Um, what if their accounts don't have enough information to enable a social media platform to even send a written notice 
There's a provision here that sets damages $50,000 per instance of failure to provide timely notice, meaning within 24 hours. But if they don't have enough information even to send the notice, what, what is the platform supposed to do? I mean, they, how would notices work under those circumstances? Um, there is just uh, way too much ambiguity here. This is this bill is uh, it's not ready to become law, and and certainly, um, even if it were a decent idea, which I would disagree with, um, the bill itself is just not ready to become law. There's just too many problems with the way it's drafted and how it might be implemented. Uh, so I, I'd be awfully frustrated if the committee would send the bill forward um, under those circumstances as well. So I'll be opposing the bill. Thank you, Senator Latz. Any further discussion on the bill? Uh, any final comments, Senator Chamberlain? I, I, uh, I look forward to a robust and thrilling debate on the Senate floor over this proposal. I truly, truly do. Thank you. Uh, Senator Limmer, sorry I didn't see your hand before. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, um, uh, I think we've, I think this bill is trying to um, uh, answer or help to uh, put a framework of regulation around specific um, tech company, high tech companies that are, um, in some cases, uh, censoring content. And uh, that would be the other side of the argument. Uh, censoring political content is normally uh, the, uh, the focus. And uh, many of these uh, tech giants uh, provide the service uh, almost to the point of being close closely akin to a regulated industry. There are very few corporations that can provide such massive service. And so um, it, it becomes not a monopoly, but maybe an oligopoly where only a few providers can provide it. And as a result, by their restriction, they censor free speech. Um, I'm not going to judge the speech entirely, but there are restrictions to specific content as well. Uh, already in practice uh, in a variety of mediums. But nevertheless, I think uh, Senator Chamberlain is trying to balance the field a little bit that, that someone else's private interpretation of speech uh, who owns a giant tech company can restrict someone else's speech. There's very few options for um, anyone trying to uh, use a different medium. And so um, I would be in favor of this bill. Uh, I think Senator Latz has uh, referenced a few ambiguities that probably should be uh, uh, discussed further, but I will vote for the bill, um, and we can have that discussion later on this year. Thank you, Senator Limmer. Senator Latz. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I appreciate Senator Limmer recognizing the ambiguities here and the need for further discussion, so my question would be when and where will that discussion take place? Uh, this is not the kind of a bill or the kind of a discussion, I should say, regarding drafting um, and technical aspects of a bill that ought to take place on the Senate floor. Uh, we're just not well equipped for those kind of conversations. That, that's, that's what we have committees for. So it seems to me the committee here, uh, you Mr. Chair, uh, I think have a responsibility within the committee to try to get these kind of things addressed in legislation before it's sent to the floor because it goes to the floor, presumably we'll have a recommendation to pass, but it's not ready not to be passed. Um, so uh, that's separate and apart from the concerns about, you know, uh, bias. And I understand, you know, from past conversations and, and, and so on uh, that this is 
this bill at least is partly intended to address a perception of bias um, among these large tech companies that's uh, against uh, more conservative thought or views. Um, but there, there have been, um, you know, analysis by uh, Politico in 2020 showed that uh, it's the uh, the right wing social media influencers and outlets and um, that dominate online discussions um, around two of the elections' biggest issues uh, back from uh, from that time. Um, and so the the liberal or left viewpoint was far less prominent <laughs> within the social media context than the right. So it may turn out that uh, uh, you know it's not not such a good idea. Uh, from that standpoint either, but or the, the problem is the opposite of the problem that perhaps the author is seeking to address. Uh, but either way, uh, whatever one believes on the merits of the bill itself, uh, it seems to me it's this committee's responsibility to try to address some of those drafting and ambiguity issues here and now and in the committee. Uh, and so I, I, that's that would be my recommendation for and have those conversations. Let's do them here where where we are better suited to do that rather than on the Senate floor. Uh, my also understanding, we should probably factor this in a little bit, is that, I mean, the, uh, the companion bill uh, has had no hearings since it was first introduced in the other body. So again, we're just kind of spinning our wheels on this one, I think. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate your advice, Senator Latz. Uh, we did have two committee hearings uh, debating this, one last year, um, one today, um, and the chair and some of the members here did not bring any other amendments beyond the technical ones. Uh, I know there could be various opinions amongst members whether they're needed or not. And we do have bills where we uh, do make amendments on the floor and that will still uh, continue to be a possibility uh, with this bill as well. So I am comfortable uh, moving it out of this committee today. Uh, members are free to vote as they see fit on it and uh, <coughs> we'll continue the discussion as it moves forward. Um, so with that members, uh, if you would turn your cameras on and unmute and uh, the clerk, the uh, correct, we're all, uh, uh, Senator Limmer, if you would uh, be willing to uh, make the motion for the bill. Uh, as chairman, I move Senate bill number 1253 be recommended to pass and move to the Senate floor. Uh, thank you, Senator Limmer. Uh, so on that motion, the clerk will take the roll on the bill. Senator Matthews? Yes. Senator Limmer? Yes. Senator Bigham? No. Senator Anderson? Yes. Senator Johnson? Yes. Senator Westrom? Senator Westrom? Senator Carlson? No. Senator Latz? No. Senator Westrom. Uh, by a vote of four to three, uh, Senate file 1253 as amended is passed and moved to general orders. Thank you, Senator Chamberlain. And uh, thank you members uh, for the first hearing of the year and I look forward to uh, more uh, discussions on this committee as we move forward. So with that, today's committee stands adjourned.